Welcome to today's program. My name is Glenn Deason. I'm a professor at the University of Southeastern Norway. Uh, with me here is my friend and colleague, Alexander Mercuris from the very popular and informative Duran. And the guest today, uh, we were able to get back uh, John Mersheimer, uh, one of the most popular IR scholars in history. So uh, welcome. Uh, it's great to see you again. It's great to be back with you guys. Uh, so since last time we spoke, I would say that the world has become more complex and more dangerous. Uh, uh, not only are we still fighting against uh, Russia and Ukraine with no clear solution, but uh, also we see now that the uh, situation has changed uh, very much, I would say, over the past two, three weeks, as we seem to come to terms with uh, that we're reaching the end of this. And uh, But making you know matters worse, we also now have another war in the Middle East, also yet again, without any clear way of resolving it. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, so today I, I thought we could really talk about uh, the strategic considerations for the United States because it appears that the U.S. decided to prioritize its conflict with uh, China, uh, which was the idea behind Obama's pivot to Asia. Uh, however, at the same time, uh, now fighting in both, or, or at least uh, seeing a lot of its resources being uh, bogged down in Europe and the Middle East. So uh, I guess during the multipolar, sorry, the, during the unipolar moment, when U.S. grand strategy largely depended on upholding its primacy in every corner of the world, uh, it it made sense to prioritize everything. But uh, with less well, reduced capabilities uh, in the new world, it seems that the U.S. still prioritize everything, but then it ends up not prioritizing anything. So, uh, Professor Mersheimer, how? Uh, I know this becomes uh, too many topics with uh, Ukraine, <laughs> Middle East, and China. But uh, it, it, how are you seeing the current development? Is there a lack of strategic focus, or what can we expect from Washington at this point? I think, Glenn, uh, on October sixth, uh, the United States was in a situation where it, it definitely saw China as the principal threat. Uh, They call it in the Pentagon the pacing threat. Uh, But, of course, we were also involved deeply in the Ukraine war. But I think the Americans thought they could handle that. And the Middle East looked like it was stable and there was really no problem there. And we didn't have to worry about it in any meaningful way. And Jake Sullivan made these famous comments where he said that the Middle East was very stable, and that was good for the United States, which, of course, it was. Then it all changed uh, on October 7th. It's really remarkable. Uh, first of all, how this just came out of nowhere. I don't know anyone, myself included, who saw this one coming. I mean, we knew that there was you know, sort of constant trouble between the Palestinians and the Israelis, especially the Palestinians in Gaza. But I don't think anybody anticipated the scale of the attack that took place on October 7th or anticipated what the consequences of that would be. But the end result is the United States is, you know, up to its eyeballs and alligators in the Middle East now, in addition to Ukraine. And of course, this has all sorts of implications for pivoting to Asia to deal with the China threat, which is what the United States is principally concerned with. Mm -hmm. So you have this fascinating situation today where you have these two major crises, uh, one in the Middle East and the other in Ukraine, uh, that show no signs of ending anytime soon and have real consequences for American grand strategy. Mm -hmm. One has been hearing a great deal in the last few weeks about an an attempt by the United States to resume dialogue with China. And there's reports, there's discussions about Xi Jinping coming to the APAC summit and perhaps meeting Biden there. And is this a piece of good fortune? Is this something that, you know, they're now going to be trying maybe to say, well, let's not focus so much on China whilst we've got these two burning problems going on. This is an opportunity to try to come to some kind of stabilization of the situation with China? Or are we going to see another failure at dialogue? Because we've had some really very unhappy results from previous summit meetings between uh, 
Xi Jinping and um, Biden in the past, um, with Xi Jinping on one occasion, according to a Chinese readout, complaining directly to Biden that you tell me one thing about US policy and then something completely different happens. I think, just building on what you said, Alexander, that the Americans understand they're in deep trouble in Ukraine and they're in deep trouble in the Middle East. And therefore, we do not want any trouble in East Asia. And if anything, we want to, you know, tamp down any tensions uh, between uh, the United States and its allies on one hand and the Chinese on the other hand. So I think that in, in a funny way, uh, these two crises outside of East Asia are forcing the United States uh, to tamp down its rhetoric and its antagonism towards China. I mean, it was quite striking how hard line the Biden administration was toward China after taking office. Uh, I mean, they really doubled down on what Trump was doing. Trump was quite hard line with the Chinese, but the, uh, the Biden administration went well beyond that. Uh, and there was, I think, little sign that we were going to change our basic approach before October 7th. But I think since October 7th, the United States has begun to change its tune in East Asia. And it's in large part because of these two crises. What about the Chinese? Might they say to themselves, this is an opportunity to take advantage of the fact that the United States is, a, is distracted by these crises? Might we look to do some things of our own um, that, you know, can work, can play to our advantage instead in Taiwan or some other place? Or will they want stability as well? I mean, for the record, I think they will want stability. I think they've got problems of their own. But maybe you have any thoughts about this? I mean, just guessing, looking at this situation. I think your comments indicated that they might take military advantage. I think they will take diplomatic advantage. I think they're taking diplomatic advantage of the situation. And it's, you know, as I like to say, it's mana from heaven for them. I mean, they get to portray themselves as the good guys. Uh, they get to blame the Americans, appropriately so, for you know, this crisis in the Middle East, because the United States did hardly anything uh, to settle the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And now the Israelis and the Americans are joined at the hip in terms of waging this war. So the Americans definitely look like the bad guys and the Chinese can talk, as can the Russians, in ways uh, that portray themselves as the good guys and the Americans as the bad guys. So I think diplomatically, they are taking advantage of this, and it's causing the United States all sorts of headaches. What they do militarily is another matter. I think with regard to Taiwan, they won't do anything as a result of this. And I think your general point, Alexander, that uh, they have problems of their own, and the last thing they want to do is start a war, is correct. But I would imagine that they'll push uh, a bit harder uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they get rougher with the Filipinos, right? Because they have a dispute with the Philippines over, you know, who controls particular portions of the South China Sea. So they may get a bit more aggressive there. But I think overall, your basic point is correct, that they're not going to get too aggressive. Yeah, Military. I think, that, yeah, I think that assessment is probably correct, because uh, uh, if uh, if they can commun can communicate to the neighborhood that uh, the United States won't be there always uh, to protect them, that you know they would have to be more careful which horse to bet on. Uh, so I, I think that there could be a lot of diplomatic benefits in terms of pushing a bit in the South China Sea. But uh, but in terms of Taiwan, I think a military campaign there would be uh, devastating. And uh, also, I don't think uh, I, I don't think it's something that the Chinese want to do because if they see time as being on their side, which they tend to, which is my impression at least, that the way they see it, uh, why do something today if you're going to be in a favorable position tomorrow? And uh, Again, if uh, the U.S. doesn't push for uh, abandoning the one China policy and uh, pushing for the secession of Taiwan, I don't think there would be any trigger which would make it uh, necessary to 
uh, yeah, you go go to that length of military means. Uh. Glenn, can I just say one thing very quickly? I think that the Chinese understand that their employment of wolf warrior diplomacy in the past was a fundamental mistake. And if you look at uh, Chinese-Australian relations at this point in time, uh, the Australian leader was just in China meeting with Xi Jinping, and they had a very positive meeting. Uh, and it looks like relations between Australia and China, and China are beginning to improve. And I think this is the direction that the Chinese want to go in. And this gets back to my point to Alexander before that I think uh, that the Chinese understand they can take advantage of the Americans now because of this mess in the Middle East. And that, coupled with abandoning wolf warrior diplomacy, will do all sorts of good things for the Chinese uh, in terms of their situation in East Asia and around the globe more generally. Yeah, well, the Australians they had a policy for many years, since uh, uh, at least since the days of John Howard, and also under Kevin Rudd. But I remember speaking to John Howard once, a former prime minister, and he he was making this uh, argument that you know they sh the the Australians should have to choose between uh, being uh, having close economic partnership with China and having this close security partnership with the U.S. Uh, however, I think over the past few years. They did exactly that. They 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 picked one against uh, the other, and uh, I think there's been many yeah, political forces in Australia which has been looking to walk this back a bit uh, and try to uh, yeah no no not not necessarily to be a frontline state. On the other hand, they they do see China as a challenge and uh, uh, as a yeah medium sized country. Obviously, uh, the United States uh, will remain their primary. Uh, security provider and uh, ally. Well, I was just in Australia, as you know, Glenn, and just talking to Australians, I, I think they understand that it's important to contain China and to limit China's growth in the region. But at the same time, they don't want a war. And they understand that they are closely allied with the United States and that the United States can behave in wild and crazy ways on occasion. Uh, so what they want to do is have their cake and eat it too, which is to contain China in some sort of reasonable way so that there is no war, but at the same time facilitate economic intercourse so they continue to get prosperous and do very well for themselves economically. But again, at the same time, making sure that there's no war. And I think given what's happening around the world today, the, the stars are lined up in a propitious way for making that happen. Because again, getting back to my discussion with Alexander, I think that the security competition out there is being damped down by the United States because of these two other crises. Can I just now turn to the Middle East crisis? Because the Middle East crisis is the most intractable crisis throughout my lifetime. I, I, it has been going ongoing all my life. I don't imagine that it's going to end be completely resolved anytime soon, despite the fact that there's talk about it being resolved. But at least at the moment, in the crisis we have at the moment, there is a risk that it could get worse, but there are opportunities, perhaps, to prevent it doing so. And again, my own sense is that America's adversaries in the Middle East, who are there, Iran, its various allies at the moment do not want to get involved in this war, that they do not want to get into a direct confrontation either with Israel uh, or with the United States. Is this something that people, first of all, is that also your own perception? And perhaps what do you think the United States is going to do? Is it also in a kind of going to get into some kind of implicit dialogue with its enemies in order to try to keep the situation under control. Because if it escalates, I mean, it could easily escalate in all sorts of ways, which I think would be very dangerous. There's no question about that. As you well know, uh, there are a lot of hawks uh, in Washington who would like to go to war uh, against Iran yesterday. Uh, 
So th there is uh, a body of people who are super hawkish on Iran. And by the way, they blame Iran uh, for uh, what Hamas did uh, for Hezbollah. Uh, Iran is the master puppeteer uh, in their story. And if we can deal with Iran, uh, that will solve all these other problems. I believe this is ridiculous. Uh, I, I believe that Hamas and, and, and uh, Hezbollah think on their own. They certainly get support from Iran, uh, but uh, taking out Iran is not going to solve those problems. Furthermore, you're not going to take out Iran. You're just going to make the situation worse. Um, and uh, so I think in the final analysis, what the Biden administration wants to do is make sure that this doesn't escalate. As we were talking about a few minutes ago, the United States has its hands full with Ukraine, China, and the present war in Gaza between Hamas and Israel. The last thing the United States needs is for this war to escalate to the point where Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran are all in the fight, and the fight with the Palestinians spreads from Gaza to the West Bank. I mean, this is a nightmare scenario. We will get pulled into it. Just look at all the military assets we have in the region. Hard to imagine us sitting that one out. So then we're in a full-scale war in the greater Middle East. This would be a disaster. So my sense is that the Biden administration is uh, playing tough with Iran and with Hezbollah, but for the purposes of preventing the war from escalating. So I don't see us uh, 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 causing this war uh, to escalate horizontally, that the Gaza, uh, uh, Israel, or the Hamas-Israel war in Gaza. And, and in fact, I think that behind the scenes, the United States is trying, with, trying as much as it can to shut this war down in, in Gaza. Uh, because it's not to our advantage. But uh, does uh, is it a, po a possibility that Israel, uh, what do they say, that the uh, tail wags the dog? Is it possible that they are pursuing uh, objectives uh, different from the United States? Uh, indeed, uh, what would what would be the objectives? Because I know, obviously, the stated objective would be to take out Hamas, which sounds like something the entire Western political media establishment would support. However, there also seems to be a wider objective in terms of resolving this, you know, Palestinian problem, which Alexander has mentioned been going on for all of our lifetimes. Uh, but uh, the, does this entail, if it entails uh, ethnically cleansing and annexing at least northern parts of Gaza? Uh, again, I hope I'm wrong, but uh, can can this objective then be achieved? But also. Uh, uh, I'm just thinking, well, what would be the reaction? Because I don't think the neighboring countries want to join in on this. But, uh, you know, I see the rage boiling uh, in the neighboring countries. I see Western allies becoming more uncomfortable with the war crimes. And even within uh, Israel, uh, there's a lot of opposition, uh, uh, which it tends to blame Netanyahu. So I'm just wondering, uh, is, is, it, is it possible for Israel to achieve what it wants? And is it possible for Israel to pull America into something it doesn't want to do? or uh, it's, a, it's a very st a strange relationship uh, between uh, Tel Aviv and Washington. Well, the general point that I would make in response to your various points is that the only solution to this problem is a political one. And the Israelis tend to think that uh, the problem can be solved militarily. Uh, this goes back to the early days of Zionism when Ziv Yabotinsky, who was a very famous Zionist thinker uh, invented this concept of the Iron Wall. And basically, the Iron Wall said that if Israel used military force, it could beat the Palestinians into submission. It could force them to accept the fact that Israel controlled uh, all of the territory and the Palestinians had no choice but to live under Israel's thumb. Uh, the Israelis have employed the iron wall for decades on end. It doesn't work. They're not going to be able to beat the Palestinians into submission. So they can pound Gaza all they want. They can destroy all the Hamas forces they want. But the Palestinians are going to come back another day and fight. They're going to rebel. They're not going to live uh, underneath uh, uh, Israeli occupation without putting up resistance. 
So the only solution along the way, the only viable solution in my opinion along the way was a two-state solution, which is where you give the Palestinians a state of their own, which is right next door to a Jewish state. That, that was the only solution. Uh, but we failed to make that happen. Every president since Jimmy Carter has tried hard to make that work, but it didn't work. And we're in the mess that we're in now. And I find it almost impossible to imagine that we're going to get a two-state solution. So this is why I agree with Alexander that this is the worst of all the crises we face. And it's hard to see you know, how we and the Israelis get out of it. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, I mean, my own feeling, and this is my own view of this, is that President Biden made a mistake when he went to Israel and embraced Prime Minister Netanyahu. And to all the external appearances, what he may have been saying in private may have been different, but to all external appearances, seemed to be giving Prime Minister Netanyahu in total endorsement to do whatever it wanted he wanted to do in Gaza. And I find it very difficult to understand myself why, given the fact that the United States does have leverage, perhaps not as much as it used to, but it still does have decisive leverage, in my opinion, over Israel in these sort of moves. It took that decision. Was it not understood... <laughs> in Washington, that if you do something like that, then you risk being dragged in to a crisis over which you may have only a limited amount of control. I mean, it, it wasn't recognized. That logic wasn't recognized in Washington, and in particular, it wasn't recognized by uh, President Biden. Let me just make a couple points on this. First of all, for a long time, it's been manifestly clear that President Biden has a passionate attachment to Israel. He is deeply committed to Israel. And I think that is what led him to go over there and to hug Bibi Netanyahu in a very public way. Even though Netanyahu and Biden have long had adversarial relations. I think that Biden's love of Israel, love of the Zionist enterprise, just caused him to go over there and do that. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're right that this was not a smart thing to do from a strategic point of view. And by the way, you can make the argument that it was not in Israel's interest for him to do that, because as was the case in the United States after 9-11, the Israelis sort of overreacted to what happened on October 7th. They were almost unhinged by the events of October 7th. And of course, this happened in the United States uh, after uh, September 11th. And we went on a crusade. Uh, we uh, did all sorts of foolish things on the foreign policy front. So I think in the Israeli case, for understandable reason, there was going to be powerful incentive or set of incentives for them uh, to do foolish things. And what was needed was for the United States to cool them down, to tell them to think long and hard about what they should do uh, to deal with this really serious problem, to put it mildly, from their point of view. But we did the opposite. We basically went over there and put uh, uh, ourselves in a position where they could do anything they wanted and we had hardly any leverage over them. And uh, now we're in this terrible mess with no sign of getting out. I, I saw that General Brown, who's the new chair, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who strikes me, by the way, as a clever man. I mean, he's somebody who understands these things rather well, at least understands them to a certain extent. Anyway, he said in... Apparently he was in Japan, but he was asked about the conflict in Gaza, and he said that destroying Hamas would be a very tall order, in other words, a challenging thing for the Israelis to achieve. I mean, is that as, should we take that as a sign that uh, 
there are some people in Washington who perhaps are saying, you know, maybe you know, in the Pentagon, maybe, you know, we, we need to start thinking in a more political way rather than in a military way. And you said that the United States might be looking for ways to tamp down this conflict, the one in Gaza. Could this be, a, you know, a sign of that, that, you know, the General Brown is talking in this way? Yeah, I I think you're right. And I, I think that he's not uh, unusual uh, in the foreign policy establishment. Even strong supporters of Israel, many strong supporters of Israel, uh, who I know are deeply depressed because they think there is no military solution to the problem. They do not believe that you can defeat Hamas in any meaningful way. And people will point out that if you listen to the Israelis talk, they say that it's going to take many months, if not a year or so, to defeat Hamas. And the question you then have to ask yourself is world public opinion and American public opinion, or more generally Western public opinion, going to support a continuation of what the Israelis are doing now for a year? Uh, and I find that hard to imagine. This is going to have to stop at some point in the not too distant future. And in the end, Hamas is not going to be defeated. Uh, and uh, so therefore, you need a political solution. But Alexander, I would ask you, what is the political solution? Yeah. Yeah, this uh, would have been <laughs> this would have been my question because I, I I tend to agree with what you said. Uh, the two state solution was pretty much the only way out. Because uh, if you look at the demographics, uh, if you look at Palestinians, uh, which is included in in, um, uh, in Gaza and the West Bank, uh, they're about fifty fifty with uh, with the Jewish people. So, so from this perspective, if you don't have a two state solution, how do you preserve the the Jewish uh, state do you, I mean, either it will be ethnic cleansing or it will be apartheid but uh, otherwise well, I, I, ju I just don't see what another solution uh, would be and uh, I, I guess the best one can hope for then would be be able to go back to the way things were b before the 7th of October but it doesn't seem like either the Palestinians or the Israelis uh, seem too interested well I think you know just to build on what you said Glenn I think that before uh, October 7th, uh, Israel was effectively an apartheid state. It's very controversial to say that, but mm. as I've pointed out on a number of occasions, uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and B'Tselem, which is the leading human rights group in Israel, all three of those organizations have produced sophisticated reports that make the case that Israel is an apartheid state. Furthermore, if you follow the uh, Israeli media like I do, it's commonplace for Israelis, including Israeli elites, to describe Israel as an apartheid state. It's only in the United States or the West more generally that you can't say that without being attacked. But it is, in large part, an apartheid state, right? Now, the problem is that since October 7th, it's become very apparent to all sorts of people that that is the case. Before October 7th, it was a rather uh, mute issue. What, what, the, what the Israelis were doing to the Palestinians was not talked about very much. It looked like the Israelis, before October 7th, were able to manage their problem with the Palestinians, both in the West Bank, where Mahmoud Abbas was doing their dirty work, and in Gaza, where they basically had the Palestinians in this giant open-air prison and under control for the most part. And in fact, as everybody knows, the Israeli government was happy to work with Hamas to undermine the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. So the situation looked as good as it could look for Israel, given the fact that you had this suffocating occupation, or if you want to call it apartheid, call it apartheid. But the situation has just fundamentally changed now. This issue was out on the front burner, and everybody's talking about how to solve it. And once you start talking about how to solve it, the issue of apartheid, the issue of occupation comes front and center. And this causes enormous problems for the Israelis.
So you want to ask yourself, what is the discourse going to look like moving forward once we get a ceasefire here? We are going to get a ceasefire at some point. Then the question is, what does it look like? Is, are the Americans really going to push hard for a two-state solution? What are the Chinese and the Russians going to do? What are the West Europeans and East Europeans going to do here? What are the Israelis going to do? Or are they going to tolerate living uh, in a state where they dominate the Palestinians with the ever-present problem of an eruption, like a first intifada, a second intifada, an October 7th? Uh, so uh, the, the world... The world has just been, the Israeli world has just been turned upside down. One cannot underestimate that. And by the way, if you look at Tom Friedman's column in the New York Times today, which I, su I would suggest that people look at, you don't have to agree with a lot of his analysis, but his description of the situation in Israel is really quite stark. It's an Israel he's never seen before. And he makes it very clear that everybody there is really scared. You've had this profound change take place in Israel. And again, the question is, where does this all lead? Mm. I, I have to say, I had very little knowledge or experience of the Israeli media until this crisis. And actually, I've been rather impressed by the level of diversity and discussion that takes place there. Certainly more than happens here in Britain. And I have to say also that I find in that a sign of hope, actually. I get the sense that a lot of Israelis do not want to live in an apartheid garrison state, that they would be amenable to a solution. But maybe expecting something like that to happen soon is to ask too much. Perhaps you can start with smaller things and, you know, we have this expression, I presume you have it in the US too, when you're in a hole, stop digging, maybe stop settlement expansion. I mean, that would perhaps ease the tensions, stop this violence that there is in the West Bank, stop these threats that are coming from, or at least marginalize these people who are making all of these threats about, you know, the Temple Mount and all of that kind of thing, which apparently there has been going on. I mean, these would perhaps not be big steps towards a, set, a, a, you know, a resolution of this crisis, but at least they would be steps of a kind. And that might provide you with some time and political space to start thinking forward about more substantive things. I have to say, I can't see any of that happening whilst Netanyahu remains prime minister, but Perhaps these are the sort of things one should be focusing on at the moment, you know, uh, these more limited things, but these more achievable things. i just make two quick points, uh, Alexander. One is, I think, uh, given the recent events, October 7th and what's happened uh, since then, it's hard to imagine the Israelis being willing to accommodate the Palestinians in almost any way. I mean, they are just so angry and they're also scared. And when you're scared, uh, that creates an environment where it's hard to make any sort of concessions. That's point one. Point two is you do not want to underestimate how far to the right Israel has moved since you and I were young. Uh, and all the evidence is it's going to move further to the right as the number of ultra-Orthodox in the society increase over time. You know, for all the complaints that people have about Benjamin Netanyahu, and I fully understand those complaints, and by the way, if you go back to the Friedman column, he is railing against Netanyahu himself. But the point I would make is that in the context of the governing coalition in Israel today, he's not on the extreme end of the political spectrum. He's really kind of in the middle. Uh, and uh, one could argue that if you get rid of him, whoever replaces him would be even more hardline. And I would argue that, you know, 5, 10, 15 years out, uh, Israeli prime ministers will probably be uh, to the right uh, of Benjamin Netanyahu today. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very pessimistic. I, I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope I'm dead wrong. 
but uh, I, I just don't see much hope here. Mm. I, I thought, uh, yeah, we could uh, switch gears a bit uh, to, to Ukraine because, uh, um, well, how, how would you see the Ukraine war being impacted by the uh, war between Israel and Palestine? I guess, obviously, in this case, it appears that the United States uh, have been forced to make priorities, and uh, the priority is now quite clear that uh, Ukraine must take a back seat uh, to uh, Israel in terms of uh, uh offering aid but uh, but uh, i don't think this has been this uh, th this isn't a real variable which changed the whole thing i think it was just it happened at a very awkward time because i think the if if not the collapse the the decline of, of ukraine has been building up for some time and uh, as we began discussing i think uh, the media seems to have changed in the west dramatically over the past two weeks suddenly you know left and right we have uh, Uh, articles recognizing that uh, you know Ukrainians are losing. Uh, just now, they announced they would start uh, uh, mobilizing women because there's no more men to fill the ranks, and uh, uh, yeah, the weapons are running out. Uh, they can't really do any more offensives. You're having internal political splits. Uh, the Russians are making uh, gains, uh, especially around Avdivka, but also other areas. I'm just wondering how how do you see since the last time we spoke? What what, what is the direction of Ukraine here? Well, I listen religiously to Alexander every day, and uh, I've learned from him that uh, the uh, Russians were winning in Ukraine uh, for a long time before October 7th. Uh, the Ukrainians are in deep trouble. Uh, this is before October 7th, uh, and it was only a matter of time before the Russians effectively won the war. We can discuss what victory looked like, but the Russians... Uh, were destined to win the war for reasons we three all know well. Uh, I think, however, it's quite clear that October 7th has sped up the process uh, yeah. because it's quite clear that the United States cares more about the Middle East, cares more about Israel, to be explicit, than it cares about Eastern Europe and Ukraine. Uh, And given that the Americans are aware that the Ukrainians are not going to win, it doesn't make sense to prioritize Ukraine over the Middle East. So I think what's going to happen here is the Americans are going to go to great lengths uh, to try and get some sort of negotiated settlement uh, in the near future. Uh, and they're not going to give uh, the Ukrainians uh, the, the resources, both in terms of money and in terms of weaponry, that they had promised them earlier. Uh, so the Ukrainians, who were doomed before October 7th, uh, are surely doomed now. Mm. I mean, how well is understood is it in the United States that this is actually a crisis, the Ukraine crisis, unlike the Middle East? The Middle East crisis is all but intractable. The Ukraine crisis could have been avoided entirely and can still be solved. <laughs> you can actually find a way forward to bring the whole thing under control. You don't need to make concessions to the Russians that would impact on the core interests of the United States. You're not going to see a collapse of the American position anywhere in the world if you negotiate a resolution of this crisis with the Russians. Is the, does, this un, does this understood within the administration? Because one of the problems, again, is that they seem to me to have got themselves trapped by this formula that, you know, you don't do anything without Ukraine, which shifts the burden for negotiation on the Ukrainians themselves, who are going to find this very difficult. Whereas the US could itself start talking to the Russians about this problem. And that probably would lead to an outcome, a positive outcome here. Well, I want to make a quick statement and then I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, delusional thinking about Ukraine in the US government and in the foreign policy establishment has been quite profound for a long period of time. 
And it remains the case to a large extent. I mean, you occasionally see evidence that people understand, especially in the media, that Ukraine is in deep trouble. But nevertheless, you still see lots of pieces where people are talking about Ukraine ultimately prevailing and all we have to do is this or that and it will rectify the situation. Uh, so I would just say to you, you don't want to place too much hope in the American government understanding the basic facts of life and trying to fix this problem as best we can. But my question to you, Alexander, is what is the solution here? You know, how do you shut this one down in a meaningful way? I, I can tell a story about how you get a frozen conflict that could uh, uh, turn into a hot conflict again. But how do you get a general peace agreement here? What does it look like so that this problem is basically put to bed? Well, it's quite interesting because Putin actually made some straight, he made, he made some comments about Ukraine very recently. There was an um, event that took place on the 4th of November, which is a public holiday in Russia. And he met various people from civil society groups. And then he went off, as he often does, on a tangent talking about Ukraine and the conflict. And he also talked about the history. He always brings up history. He's a very historically minded person. But if you sort of took it aside, looked at what he was saying, it seemed to me that he was basically setting out the basis for a negotiated a negotiating position. And I want to say clearly, a negotiating position. I'm not suggesting that he's talking here about the eventual outcome or the outcome that he would accept. But he made some points. He said, first of all, there are areas of Ukraine which have always been historically Russian. The uh, Bolsheviks created this bigger Ukraine. These areas which are Russian, well, some of them, most of them are returning to the homeland. And my impression was that if Ukraine were to accept the four regions plus Crimea as part of Russia, that would settle the problem completely as far as he was concerned. He has some concerns about other cities. He talked about cities in Ukraine, in southern, in southern Ukraine especially, which were created by Catherine the Great, which are Russian cities. So that would include presumably Odessa, but he wasn't talking about uniting those regions with Russia. So I can see that he was is probably thinking about some kind of protections for Russians there, some kind of role for Russians there. Then he also talked about Ukraine itself, the core region of Ukraine. And he went all the way back to the 17th century. He talked about how at that time it consisted of an area in, around Kiev, Chernigov, Zhitomir, he seemed to accept that that is distinct in some fashion. He made it absolutely clear, though, that this part of Ukraine, this central region, certainly under no circumstances can be part of NATO. And um, I got the impression that basically he doesn't think that, you, you know, he doesn't want to see Ukraine in NATO. But one thing that also struck me about the comments that he made was that he said absolutely nothing about the western regions of Ukraine, the Habsburg provinces, places around Lvov. He doesn't seem to have any interest in those at all. And also, he said nothing about sanctions. Now, he avoids talking about sanctions altogether, but he was talking here about how he was talking about how the conflict in Ukraine might evolve. So I don't think that he would be looking for any kind of sanctions relief. I think he understands that that would be impossible to get from the United States. I don't think he feels that that's needed. I think he's prepared to let Western Ukraine go its own way completely. I think that for the central regions of Ukraine, he as I said, certainly doesn't want to see them in NATO. And that is, I think, for him, an absolute red line. So 
I think there is a basis for a discussion here, not an easy one. And he didn't talk. And I thought, found this again interesting. He didn't talk this time about reopening the whole security situation in Europe, which he has done in the past. Perhaps over the course of negotiations, he might want to have some kind of strategic dialogue with the United States. The Russians have recently spoken about the need to restart a strategic dialogue with the United States, but they say that can only happen once the war in Ukraine ends. So I think there is a room, you know, if people are pragmatic and realistic and understand that the Russians, you know, are winning the war. I, I, I think that there is room for some kind of discussion. And I think that what Putin wants, what I think not just Putin, but the Russian leadership collectively want, is a stable situation on their Western borders. They no longer think that they can develop a productive relationship with the Western European countries. I think that's become um, clear. But Putin also said, and this is an interesting comment that he made very recently, he said that with the Europeans, for the moment, we can't have a real dialogue with them. They lack agency. They have decided what they want. But with the United States, we can get back into discussion eventually. So he seems to be thinking that some kind of a dialogue with the United States would work in Russian interests and can be resumed and can move forward productively. But all of the previous plans of you know establishing gas pipelines, all those kind of things to the Europeans, I think this has been parked to one side. But let me just push you just a bit on this. Yeah. I think what you're saying is that the only possible deal here is the Russians get to keep the four oblasts they've now annexed yes. plus Crimea. Yes. And in return, you get a genuinely neutral Ukraine. It yes. breaks all ties with NATO. And I would imagine even the EU. I think so. There's a military dimension inside the EU. Okay. I agree with you. I think if you want to get a deal now, that's the deal. And I think there's a reasonably good chance you could get that. But here's the question I have for you. Do you think that the Americans and the Ukrainians would accept that deal? Well, this is a, this is the great question. I don't think the Ukrainians at the moment are capable of accepting a deal like that. And that's why I said I, I think that saying all the time that, you know, we're not going to do anything without the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians must take the lead in these negotiations, is to, is to take you nowhere at all, because the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian political system, cannot negotiate on this basis. It's not that there aren't people in Ukraine, even within the government, who don't see the way that the situation is shaping out and who might not want to negotiate along these lines. But the problem is that the system, the political system in Kiev is now so fragmented and there are so many people who are still so dogmatic, ideologically opposed to these kind of concepts and who would probably, by the way, even prefer an outright defeat to a compromise of this nature, which would compromise their own vision of Ukraine. And, you know, this isn't something one should underestimate. Now, I don't think the Ukrainians are capable of doing this. But if the Americans start pushing in this direction, if they start holding discussions with the Russians quietly about this, and the, the time window is not great, by the way, because he did say other things which are more ominous as well. But the, if the Americans were to start broaching these ideas to the Russians, then I think that with the Americans, the Russians could move forward. Now, it would be complicated to persuade the Ukrainians to agree to all of this. But this isn't like Vietnam, where, you know, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese always saw South Vietnam as part of their country, which they wanted to take over. For the moment, 
that doesn't seem to be Putin's objective. He's not looking to take over the whole of Ukraine. And it would be very challenging for Russia, as I think you've discussed it yourself. It would be very challenging for the Russians to achieve that militarily anyway. So I think that there is a basis for a discussion between the United States and Russia. That's possible from the Russian side. The question is, and I, I can't speak here for the US, I haven't seen any sign that in the US people are thinking about this, at least not within the current administration. But, I mean, perhaps there are others who might be. I mean, this is the, this is the big question. Once... Let me just jump in here a second. Uh, given what you said about the fact that there are a lot of Ukrainians who would be opposed to giving up any territory, if I'm playing Russia's hand, right, I'm playing Russia's hand, and I'm in the driver's seat militarily, and I know that in the future there's a possibility that Ukraine may want to come back and take territory, don't I have an incentive to take four more oblasts now, to yeah. take Kharkiv, uh, to take Odessa, and so forth and so on? Don't I want to take almost half of Ukraine and make Ukraine really a dysfunctional state, rump state? So down the road, if things turn south, I'm better positioned than I would be if I froze the present situation on the ground well i think that there are certainly voices in moscow that are thinking in exactly that way and i think putin is absolutely open to that kind of thinking and uh, you, you can see that there is at the moment a debate going taking place that is why this can only end in that manner if there's an agreement between the americans and the russians and one which the russians were confident the the, the, the way i outlined um it could only end in that kind of way if it was agreed between the Russians and the Americans, and the Russians were confident that the Americans would stick with it. But um, given the trend, the course of events, I, I think that quite plausibly the Russians would take more. And we come back to what Putin said about these cities, and he was clearly referencing Odessa here. But of course, not just Odessa, places like Nikolaev, which is the great shipyard, and um, other cities on the um, Black Sea coast. Kharkiv. Kharkiv as well, as well, but also cities that were created by Catherine the Great and Potemkin. He was specifically referencing those, and he says, these are Russian cities. And talking in that way, he basically is signaling that, you know, Unless there's some kind of agreement that satisfies Russian security concerns now and which will stick and which they're confident will stick with the future, they will, they will, they will go on pressing forward until they take these places too. And I think militarily they, they increasingly think they can. He also said something else, by the way, which was uh, potentially very ominous and should not be underestimated, because I said that he always talks about history, and he was talking about 17th century history now, and he was talking about how the original Ukraine that broke away from Poland came to join Russia. And he said that the Ukrainians of that time, those in Kiev and Chernigov and Zhitomir, they sent a letter to the Tsar, the Russian Tsar, in, which is still apparently in the Russian archives, in which they referred to themselves as Russian Orthodox people. Now, I don't think he meant by that that um, today these people are Russian. But we've had in Russia, this is something where I think Glenn is much more informed than I am, but we have in Russia increasingly this developing concept of the Ruski Mir, the Russian world. And it did seem to me that what Putin was hinting at there was that unless there's a deal done very soon, the Russians will not just take the four regions, the four oblasts, and perhaps you know an awful lot more, but that they might consider also Kiev, Zhitomir, and Chernigov as part of the Russian world, 
in which case whatever government is left in that region of Ukraine um, would have to be in some way um, a satellite of Moscow's. I think in the I think in the West we tend to underestimate the the impact of what the Minsk agreement meant because uh, uh, there's all there's a very little trust now. That's my impression in Moscow that they that uh, any, any agreement we could offer them. So can uh, I just cut it? Can I just be, cut it back. Then. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, because you're absolutely correct. And in those same comments, Putin actually mentioned the Minsk agreement, and he actually spoke about the absence of trust. So it, in in all and this was in the same discussion as the one that I've just been discussing, mm-hmm. where, where he made all those other points which I've just been discussing. Because I guess uh, if if they could get a deal now uh, in which they do not take more territory, but they would be certain that Ukraine would remain neutral, not join NATO, and also that the uh, the language and cultural rights of uh, Russian speakers in the south and east. Uh, that they, this would be protected, I think they would go for a deal. The, the problem is the the trust is gone, and uh, a, any agreement you would come with, uh, they would have to see it in the context, not just Minsk, seven years of being, uh, well, uh, fooled eff- effectively, but they see all other agreements back from, uh, you know, the NATO-Russia Founding Act of 97. It was very specific. We weren't supposed to place any troops in the new member states. Uh, but only recently, the NATO ge- General Secretary said, oh, this is unacceptable. That means you have a uh, two-tier system within NATO, so we were openly denouncing agreements we made in the past. So I think I don't think they would they would need something very solid in order to trust this. So, and in the absence of it, I I, I also think that uh, they might go for more territory, which would mean yeah, prolonging the war. Um, that being said, I think uh, it would be hard. To, uh, I also agree that they don't want to talk to the Europeans. They said that even. Back in December of 21, that was the point. Uh, let's just talk to Washington. Uh, it's kind of pointless to talk to the Europeans. Uh, but but I think that, uh, as, uh, yeah, John mentioned, uh, the, the delusion, I think, um, w- w- would be difficult uh, for, for Washington to, dis- to be discuss as well. Because in the U.S., just like in this country, by the way, uh, we've been talking for two years that Ukraine is winning, Ukraine is winning. But now we're kind of coming to terms, OK, they're not winning, but we kind of replaced it with a new delusion because now we're saying, well, there's a stalemate. And uh, but, but still, if you look at the actual uh, war of attrition, the artillery rates, the missiles, the equipment, the amount of mobilized men, uh, these numbers are shifting very quickly in in Russia's favor, so it's not a stalemate, and at, uh, so at at some point something's going to break uh, on the Ukrainian side. So I I think if they want to negotiate based on this premise that we're now in a stalemate as opposed to Ukraine winning, we just replaced I think one delusion with another, which would then uh, result in uh, I guess the Western side entering discussions with uh, uh, with uh, conditions which would be well too too unacceptable to the Russians. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but John, well, what is your <laughs> views on this? I'd like to make a quick comment and then ask you a question, Glenn. I think in terms of stalemate, people who make that argument focus on territory, how much territory has been gained or lost by either side. And of course, there it kind of does look like a stalemate if you just use territory as the indicator. But uh, that's not the key indicator. The key indicator is casualty exchange rate. And the casualty exchange rate uh, despite the fact it's hard to get precise numbers, I believe decisively favors the Russians. I think the Ukrainians have lost enormous numbers of soldiers. It sickens me to just think about the number of people who have died uh, in the counteroffensive alone. Uh, but since the start of this war, and this is due in large part to the fact that the Russians have a massive advantage in artillery, and then the Ukrainians were foolish enough to launch this crazy counteroffensive, which was doomed to fail. But it's not a stalemate because what matters in a war of attrition is the casualty exchange ratio, and it favors the Russians greatly, and they have a much larger population. And this, of course, explains... Uh, why uh, the Russians are going to win this one. We can debate what victory looks like. But Glenn, the question I have for you as a West European, if the deal that Alexander described uh, is put into place, this is going to look like a humiliating defeat for NATO. Russia is going to effectively win. Ukraine is not going to become part of NATO. It's the end of the open door policy. 
What do you think will be the consequences of Alexander's outcome for NATO and for Western Europe? Uh, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think it's it's not just humiliating for 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 NATO, but I think it can cause a lot of divisions. Uh, uh, just a uh, before answering that, a quick note based on what Alexander said before. If you look at the Ukrainians' ability to negotiate, this would be so weak because uh, I think a lot of unity was premised on the idea that they would be able to win. But once they have to negotiate and recognize defeat, I think you have the political leaders like Zelensky clashing with the military, which is quite upset about being pressured into this offensive, which they see as a uh, you know PR war, and uh, you know you have the uh, you have the uh, civil society, you have the far right nationalists. All of them will start to I think collide, or their fragmentations will deepen if they put in a position where they have to negotiate. But in terms of NATO, I think uh, it, it it looks a bit like it could go both ways. On one hand, I, I keep hearing the rhetoric uh, in the media every day that uh, this war has brought NATO closer than ever before. That uh, because of this external threat. It necessitates uh, greater uh, integration. On the other hand, I think uh, uh, some countries, especially in Germany, might see itself as uh, uh, yeah, will re reconsider some of the security arrangements because uh, uh, as more and more now, as we now have to speak more about uh, actually having negotiations, I think their media is opening a bit more about what actually happened, what, what led to this war. And uh, as we begin this debate, I think. Uh, uh, the knowledge that we could have prevented this war quite easily. And also, once it started that it was actually peace negotiations were sabotaged. I think uh, uh, like a former NATO general, uh, uh, Harald Kuyat, the, the German army, you know, he was making this argument that uh, he thinks uh, in, in, in NATO might fragment because he, think, he thinks the Americans threw the Germans, uh, you know, on the front line against the Russians and now uh, yeah, f f effectively leaving them very exposed. So I, I think this could uh, have a serious damaging impact on, on NATO. And I know that some people are trying to make a victory lap that, you know, okay, we lost Ukraine, but at least we got, uh, you know, Sweden and Finland. But uh, I've heard a lot of voices now from Sweden and Finland, which never had majority support for joining NATO until, you know, the emotions took over uh, last year. And uh, and then, you know, they were pulled in very fast without the referendums or anything. Uh, so I think... Uh, it, it 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 could be uh yeah it 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 it, it could be a pyrrhic victory if you will if it it might not actually work in our advantage and i think nato could could fragment but again uh it's hard, it's hard to predict uh, you know but glenn just to go back to where we started uh you want to also remember that given the new focus on the middle east and given the pivot to asia that works against nato as well so you could have a double whammy here in the sense that NATO suffers a significant defeat in Ukraine, point number one, but point number two, because the Americans are deeply committed now in the Middle East, and of course, they care greatly about China and the pivot to Asia, that NATO will be left in the dust. Yeah, and I think this was, all, this was always the trade-off. The United States provides security for the Europeans, and then the Europeans, they tend to uh, well, let's say obey or, or be more 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 compliant, uh, accepting uh, U.S. leadership. And I think you know over the years we always complained the, the Americans would say you know the, the Europeans should pay more for security, and the Europeans complain you know we should have more uh, political autonomy. Uh, but I think that uh, you, you're very correct. I think now that uh, uh, in this crisis, uh, first of all, NATO didn't seem able to deliver what it promised. I think, uh, and also at the same time, the United States will try to pivot to Asia, but also to the Middle East. I think some of this trade has uh, weak, weakened further because for the Europeans now, they have uh, effectively surrendered a lot of all of their strategic autonomy. Remember for so long, the EU talked about strategic autonomy, European sovereignty. This yeah. is all out the window. And at the same time, we see America will take its focus and its resources uh, elsewhere. So we're, you know, we're not the center of the world anymore. So I, I think this, this trade-off uh, in terms of uh, giving up political sovereignty, but on the other hand, uh, getting American uh, security, I, I think this is all, all now gone because we have now no, given up all sovereignty almost and we have uh, we will have much less uh, security. And I think a defeat in Ukraine uh, would only uh, add to this uh, yeah, problematic equation, if you will.
I just would say just very quickly, I actually don't believe that if you get the deal Alexander was talking about or some variation of it, that Russia would then be a threat to Eastern Europe, much less Western Europe. I think the idea that Russia is this great military threat to Europe is is, uh, is not a serious argument. Uh, the Russians have no ambitions. They're not even going to conquer. I think we all agree on this. Not even going to try to conquer all of Ukraine. They would be crazy to try and conquer all of Ukraine. They would run into huge resistance from the ethnic Ukrainians in the center and in the western part of the country. Uh, and again, as we've talked about ad nauseum, the Russians had no interest in even invading Ukraine, right? Uh, it was NATO's foolish policy, as Jens Stoltenberg has now made clear, uh, that precipitated this disaster. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I would just uh, yeah, quickly also point out that I think w w one of the things we missed from the, the consequence of 2014 was uh, Russia largely abandoned its dreams about uh, finding a post-Cold War settlement with the Europeans because it had this Greater Europe uh, initiative before then, built based on you know Gorbachev's common European home. But not only did they drop this, I would argue that they also dumped uh, uh, the Western-centric foreign policy ever since Peter the Great 300 years ago. Because what they've been doing since 2014 has been to have their own pivot to Asia, economic pivot. So no one in the West seems to ask why why we thought we could uh, collapse the Russian economy before the weekend. And yet now, two years later, we haven't been able to put a proper dent in it. And I think this is because 2000, since 2014, they made sure that their strategic industries, uh, technological partnerships, transportation corridors, uh, bank currencies, all of this were aligned more towards the, the East. Uh, well, what they're calling it is the greater... Eurasian partnership, where they seek a uh, balanced, uh, multipolar Eurasia. So this is very different from Russia in the 19th and 20th century when they had hegemonic uh, ambitions. They neither had the intention or the capability it would be well foolish to even uh, uh, pursue such a goal. And I think, uh, I think this is actually something we we, we might welcome because uh, uh, we, we we tend to think of multipolarity in Eurasia being something. Uh, negative, but uh, from Russia's perspective, they would have liked to have a bit closer relations with Europe, just so they wouldn't become too dependent on China, because they're very they accept Chinese leadership, but they will not accept Chinese dominance. And the difference is if Russia is able to diversify its economic partnerships. But this is what uh, is I find to be uh, so strange, because when you know when we're trying to undermine the Eurasian Economic Union, that means the Central Asian states will become more dependent on China instead. You know, when trying to split the Germans from the Russians, the Russians will be more dependent on, on, uh, on, uh, on, on China. And I, I just uh, we, we do this not even just with the Russians. We do the same with Iran, push, pushing the uh, Indians to decouple from Iran. Well, then Iran will be even more dependent on China. So I think that uh, Russia sees itself as a balancer in Eurasia. And I think if if we would pull back a bit, uh, I think a natural balance would. Uh, would establish itself, which is why uh, it could be beneficial for the United States as well. But again, I, I tend to be more optimistic <laughs> about this uh, Eurasian construct, of course. So I think I interrupted you, Alexander. Well, what I was going to just say was that I, I entirely agree. I don't think the Russians are any kind of threat to Eastern Europe. I follow the Russian media, which you know you can you can do. You can read what they say. You can see what Russian officials say. You can see what Putin himself says. And they've never shown the slightest interest in wanting to return to Eastern Europe. I think they know perfectly well that doing so would be far beyond their resources and it would not be in their interests to do in any way at all. I think what the Russians want is stability and security on their western borders. They don't want NATO close to their territory, which is unsurprising. That's what great powers do. They don't want another great power encro encroaching too close to their own territory. They don't want that to happen. They want NATO kept away and their optimal outcome, their optimal solution. I think this is what Putin was basically saying is that they would like a general framework arrangement with the United States, not the kind of close relationship that was being talked about in the 1990s. I think that's all forgotten. I mean, that's they've given up on that entirely. 
but a relationship with the United States, which ensured stability on their Western borders. They don't want to encroach on Eastern Europe because they know that would involve the Americans, um, with, that would get them into problems with the Americans and with the Europeans also. But they also want the Americans to recognize that they don't want the Americans pushing too hard against them. Then the Russians can focus on sorting out their pressing internal problems, which are, you know, not inconsiderable and which they talk about all the time and which they're concerned about. I mean, their economy has stood up to the sanctions pressure well, but they are still in a difficult period of transition, as they fully recognize. And sorting those problems out at the moment is their priority. So they want they want a period after this war of stability. And if they can get it through an agreement with the United States, then that, as I said, for them would be a good outcome. The danger is that we won't have that negotiation and that agreement with the United States. And then in that case, even if the Russians um, don't particularly want to move deeper into Ukraine, they might decide that in order to keep the West further at bay, in order to avoid a situation where Ukraine might in the absence of such an agreement with the United States, emerge again as a potential threat to them, then they might feel that they not only have to move further west into Ukraine, but that they might have to make arrangements in Ukraine themselves, which costly to themselves, though they might be, in terms of time and effort and money, is the only outcome that can secure that modicum of stability and security on their western borders that they need. And that would be less than an optimal outcome for them. But coming back to the question about NATO, um, yes, the agreement that we that Putin is floating, and as I say, he's only floating. This is, you know, we're not yet in negotiations. So things might be modified. But yes, this agreement would be a big blow to NATO, but it would not be the existential disaster that a further Russian advance deeper into Ukraine and a potential collapse of the Ukrainian state as we know it would be. That would really put the whole question of whether NATO really is capable of providing East European states or Middle European states with long-term security guarantees, that really might put it into jeopardy. So I think that the United States also has a good reason to pursue this kind of negotiation. Whether it will, of course, is another matter. You know, our focus here, appropriately so, is on sort of Ukraine and mm. just Ukraine. But if you think about the region, there is all sorts of potential for escalation beyond Ukraine. First of all, there's the Black Sea. Mm. Secondly, there's Transnistria. Mm. Third, there's Belarus. What happens when Lukashenko goes and the Americans try to foster a color revolution in Belarus, right? Then there's the Baltic, where the Baltic Sea is basically surrounded now by NATO countries, now that Finland and Sweden are in the alliance. And very importantly, there's the Arctic, right? Of the eight countries that are physically located in the Arctic, seven of them are NATO countries. Mm. The one exception, of course, is Russia. And the Russians have now brought the Chinese along with them, much to their chagrin. They did not want to have to do this, but they need all the help they can get up in the Arctic. Mm. So you have potential for trouble in the Arctic, the Baltic, Belarus, Transnistria, and the Black Sea, in addition to potential problems inside Ukraine itself. So this is a very dangerous situation. You know, we talk about horizontal escalation in the context of the Middle East, appropriately so. But it's not only the Middle East, it's also in Eastern Europe. Yeah, but yeah, I, I completely agree. And these are very intractable problems. And they're basically hostages to fortune, which bad policies have created. I mean, you know, we should not have pushed the, all this way into these areas without 
perhaps thinking better about the kind of intractable, intractable problems that we're seeing. What the Russians, this is why the Russians, as I said, for their point of view, and some kind of long-term enduring uh, agreement with the United States would remain an, opt um, an optimal outcome because all of these things have happened. Undoing them, how do you undo them? I mean, you know, you don't want to invade these countries. You, you, breaking up NATO is, you know, it's a nice thing to think about, but um, I don't think that Putin, very practical man that he is, probably thinks it's an achievable objective. So better come to some kind of solution with the United States, provided it's an enduring one, which means that you can somehow de-escalate all these tensions so that the Russians can get on with their affairs and the Americans can get, can get on with their affairs also. That, I think, as I said, is the optimal one from the Russian point of view. But if that can't be done, if you can't come to an agreement like that, then the Russians have shown that they will protect their interests, their security e interests in uh, the what they used to call the near abroad. They will do that in Ukraine. Whether they are already doing that in Ukraine. They're doing that in Belarus, and they'll be very heavily involved now in what is going on in Belarus. They brought uh, Lukashenko himself on board fully. Undoubtedly, they will have their people in Minsk. They'll be ensuring that their uh, um, you know, economic ties are there. They'll be you know, keeping track on everybody who is in uh, Belarus. They'll be looking at Transnistria and Moldova. They'll be looking at Armenia. They can, they can defend their interests in all of these places. And they will do so. But rather than spend time, energy, effort, putting out the fires in all of these places, I think they would still prefer some kind of general security arrangement with the United States. That means the United States stays out of Belarus. It stays out of the Southern Caucasus, which is another area where the Russians are concerned about. It probably stays out of Moldova, but at least NATO does. Um, and um, if that can happen, and the Russians can be sure that that will stick, and that's very difficult to get that to stick in, with the United States, and the Russians know that. But if they can be sure that that will stick, they would be content with that outcome. If not, as I said, they have the means and the will, and they've shown that they have both to ensure the defense of their own interests as they see them. What's very interesting, just picking up on what you said just now, the Russians from the get-go have been interested in a general security arrangement in Europe. Yes, uh, They were not interested in conquering territory. They understood uh, that they had lost the Cold War and occupying Eastern Europe was a nightmare. Did they want to really go back and do that again? Uh, the East Germans revolted in 53, the Hungarians in 56, the Czechs in 68. They almost had to go into Poland three times. And then there are the Albanians and the Romanians. Oh, my God, do you really want to go back and conquer those territories? No. They wanted to work out some sort of security arrangement. The biggest problem is the United States. The United States then and even now has a crusader mentality. The United States is deeply committed to running around the world and interfering in the domestic, interfering in the domestic politics of all sorts of countries to make them into democracies. Right? People talk all the time about American leadership. We need American leadership, which means America has to run the globe. And the end result is that that runs right up against the Russian desire to create some security arrangement where Russian interests are taken into account. The Americans are not interested in taking Russian interests into account or Chinese interests into account unless they absolutely have to. Because we think we are the benign hegemon and we have a right and a responsibility to run the world. And boy, when you're dealing with a country like that, it's very hard to get meaningful agreements. And that's why one could argue, if anything, Putin was too trusting of the Americans for too long a period of time. I think that Putin really believed 
for a long time, even after the famous Munich conference in 2007, where he expressed his anger at the West, especially the United States, even after that, he was too trusting of the Americans. Well, that is exactly correct. And of course, he doesn't trust them anymore. And he's made that very clear. And uh, that's why getting this agreement, if it can be done, it will be very, very difficult and might, might not be possible because, of course, you're completely correct, I'm sure, about the United States. It finds it very, very difficult to negotiate these kind of arrangements with the Russians. By the way, I should say that I've been reading articles recently in the Russian media that talk about a new Yalta, time for a new Yalta, <laughs> which, of course, to the Russians... They would perceive it very differently from the way that word is perceived in the United States. So again, we can see the vast chasm of uh, uh, you know uh, conception there. But uh, the Russians would like these kind of arrangements, and um, I think because they ha they are in the process of achieving a military victory in Ukraine and have demonstrated to the Americans that they have the ability and the will to defend their interests. They're hoping that pragmatically the Americans might come round this time and that they can secure something which they can actually con consider more solid so that there might be... Now, Putin was talking back in December about a treaty which would be ratified by the Senate. I have to say, I think that's a pipe dream to be to be honest but anyway that's my own view but anyway um something that would stick that would um you know could be come part of international law something of that kind now as as whether that's achievable whether that can happen is another matter but yes you're absolutely correct the russians and the americans see things in a completely different way the russians do not any longer have a messiah messianic complex. They're not out to spread communism around the world. The periods of time when they did have those ideas relative to their whole history is actually quite brief. This is a more typical Russian approach to policy if you look at the sweep of Russian history. But they, this would be the optimal outcome for them. But just to say once more, the time window for this is not unlimited. The war is taking its course. Um, if the Russians sense that the Americans are not interested in coming to these kind of terms, then the Russians will just press on and make the arrangements, dictate the arrangements that suit them. And if that means fighting fires, they have, or so they believe, the means to douse them. I think that what's missing from the Russian imperialist uh, argument is the mm. the whole story of what actually has happened, because it is a common thread for the past 30 years, what the Russians have been doing. Because if you look back af after the Cold War uh, ended in 89, they, you know, they, they did have this goal to, like uh, John pointed out, to create a uh, security arrangement in Europe. And, and, and like I think we discussed before, they got it for a while. They had the charter. Paris uh, for a new Europe in uh, sorry the charter for a new Europe in Paris no sorry the first uh, in 1990 where they agreed we would have a Europe without dividing lines and indivisible security we would form the OSCE based on this in 1994 and this was the whole problem of NATO expansion we we, we cancelled inclusive European architecture but the time and time again they they tried to find other ways they. They, even Yeltsin Putin suggested we, we could join NATO. Uh, in uh, in 2005, they had an agreement with the EU. They would harmonize the integration initiatives so there wouldn't be any dividing lines in the common neighborhood. In 2008, you had President Medvedev proposing a you know, new pan-European security architecture, which could fit NATO within, but be all under the same roof. Uh, you know, the EU-Russia union, which was proposed, we had all this time proposals for a common Europe, because without it, what we refer to as European integration means, uh, you know, where do we draw the new dividing lines? And this is why we always have this, you know, this deeply divided societies from Moldova and Georgia, uh, Ukraine, that uh, uh, if, if they have to join NATO, it's two problems. One, that means uh, a large part of the population, which is pro-Russian, will be marginalized, which we saw in Ukraine as well. And second will be you would have a uh, hostile military alliance on their borders. So, so uh, 
So if, if you leave out this whole story for 30 years that the Russians have been working very hard to realize effectively, you know, Gorbachev's idea of a, a common European home, uh, then all you're stuck with is, you know, Russian nationalism, restoring the Soviet Union and, you know, Russian empire. But uh, I think uh, I agree. I think it's uh, uh, it is very flawed. Um, yeah. Uh, the point that I would just make very quickly, Glenn, just to support you, is there's no evidence to support that. I mean, that's the key point here. There's just no evidence. There's no evidence that Vladimir Putin is an imperialist who is bent on creating a greater Russia. Uh, it's hard to make this argument in the West. People accuse you of being a Putin apologist or what have you. But I'm sorry, there just is no evidence. Yeah, even the largest uh, Russophobe, I guess, uh, Michael McFall, even he recognized no one in Russia was asking to take back Crimea before uh, the West uh, topple, exactly. uh, topple the government. So it's uh, exactly. I, I'm not sure why why it become controversial to say that this is not about territory. It's about uh, the security architecture. Uh, but of course, uh, if they can't get an agreement, then they will impose one. And that that does entail altering territory. So I, I, I would see the territorial conflict as a being a symptom of a collapsing security architecture as opposed to being uh, yeah, the main variable. But you also want to remember, Glenn, that up until 2014, when the crisis broke out, February 2014, nobody in the West was arguing that NATO expansion was designed to contain Russia, right? Michael McFall was not telling Putin that we're expanding NATO to contain you. He was telling Putin he didn't have to worry about NATO expansion because it was not aimed at Russia. And the United States was a benign hegemon that was interested in creating a giant zone of peace in both Eastern Europe and Western Europe. So the key point here is we did not see Putin as an imperialist before February 2014. And the reason we then switched our rhetoric and turned into turned him into one of the world's great imperialists, the second coming of Adolf Hitler, after February 2014, is because we wanted to be able to blame him for the outbreak of the crisis and not be in a position where we had to blame ourselves for expanding NATO eastward to include Ukraine and Georgia. I completely agree. Uh, anyways, we, we seem to be running out of time. Uh, any final words before we wrap this up? Well, I, 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 as I said, I think there is a deal possibly possible to be made. But coming back to the points you were making, John, is there any real chance that the United States will take? There is even, even an understanding in the United States, not just within the administration, but in the wider political class, that they will act that you know that there is an actual possibility of coming to a political diplomatic resolution of this, because. As we said at the start of the pro program, we have multiple crises now in all sorts of places, in Ukraine, in the Middle East, potentially in the Far East, perhaps in other places that we can't even think of now. And the United States is itself looking, well, it, it's got an awful lot on its hands. You would have thought that it would want to have fewer problems, not more problems. And it, but if it could bring to an end, at least for our lifetimes, uh, you know, the crisis that we now have in Europe, that would be a geopolitical plus for the United States. But are they capable of thinking in this way? Are they able to move forward and to start this kind of substantive negotiation, which the Russians are at the moment talking about? I think only if they have no choice. Yeah. You know that famous saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, I think the Americans' learning curve is pretty much flat. They just don't learn. The Amer I'm talking about the American foreign policy establishment. And uh, it's hard for me to believe that they will suddenly see the light. However, if circumstances around the world leave them little choice. Remember what we were saying about American policy towards China these days, that the Americans are trying to tamp down uh, the competition they're, they're, because they're so preoccupied in Ukraine and now in the Middle East. It could be the case that if the situation in East Asia 
and in the Middle East gets much worse in both of those places, that they have no choice, American policymakers, but to think wisely about uh, events in Ukraine. But I would not hold my breath. It's a bleak thought that things have to get worse in order to get better, <laughs> in effect. That's what yeah, we have similar comments that, uh, you know, maybe if the economy collapsed, then we will have, uh, but this is kind of, uh, yeah, ter terrible ways of thinking as well, that things have to get so much worse before they can get better. But uh, I, I think the main problem which obstructs is also what, what yeah, jo John pointed out before, which is the, uh, the disease, because for Russia, for the past thousand years, since uh, Kievan Rus collapsed and the Mongolians invaded, uh, a key struggle has been to find reliable maritime corridors. And this was, you know, lar defined a large part of its history. And I think in Europe, they only have three real corridors. And the one would be Black Sea. And uh, of course, NATO getting hands on Crimea would, would put an end to that. And then you have the Baltic Sea. But of course, now with the Baltic states and Sweden and Finland in NATO, uh, even the former NATO Secretary General, Secretary General said, oh, you know, in the future we could put a blockade on St. Petersburg in, in the in the Baltic Sea. And the third one, of course, uh, is is the Arctic. And the Americans will now open four military bases in Norway, making us a frontline state. And uh, you know, so so the it seems that this is a huge concern for the Russians. And I think scaling back one, or then scaling back all of them, I think would be uh, I don't know, too too tall of an order, as uh, you know he's. To use your words. Uh, so, John, uh, any final words before we wrap up? I only want to say it was a pleasure dealing with you guys. And uh, I thought we covered a lot of territory and, you know, said some interesting things about some very interesting and depressing subjects. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you very much for joining us again, John. Yeah, thanks again. You're welcome. Be well. <laughs>